lot of you will be using the system, um, and then you'll be saving your data as .spa files or group files and going back to your own place where you may not have the software. So let's look at if once you have the data, what you can do with it or how you will process them. So one of the nicest things that you can do, like if you have just measured 10 spectrum up here, and then you want to take it back to your own labs and um, want to do like nice pics and create nice reports and everything like that, uh, you don't really have to stick to the um, instrument um, software or anything like that. You just copy it, let's save the doc as PF files, copy it, take it back, and um, what you can do is you can use the Omnic in cloud feature. So basically what this allows you is to take the IR spectroscopy anywhere you want. What we say is like, so the Omnic is also available in cloud. So um, if you Google it, it will just come up. Um, if this is the Omnic in cloud, you just if you Google it, you should be able to go down. And uh, what this does is you can go, <coughs> get an account and then you should be able to um, view your data, you should be able to <clears throat> do peak pickings, just go down. So you can just open this in, in your phone, in your iPad, wherever, whichever device you use, wherever you have internet, just use this so that way you're not stuck to the instrument or lab or anything like that to look at your data, right? Uh, create your report, create a PowerPoint presentation. You just don't have to be stuck. You just can open it anywhere because the image files, like even if you're doing like a lot of imaging work, microscopy work, imaging, images you're going to save as .jpg. So that you can open anywhere. You have nothing to worry, right? It's only for the data files. The other options you can always do is you can always save the data as .csv, then import it into Excel and open that. So that's also an option. But when you go to um, Omnic in Cloud, it's basically giving you the options, not all the options that you will have in the software, but the simple things like peak pics, a simple search, or just creating a simple report, showing some uh, matches and stuff like that. And again, this is in a very initial phase, so every few months, I would say every six months, we keep on adding features to it. So. Um, you can do a lot more than what this web page can say. Um, so anybody can register, so our students, anybody, or you don't have to have yes, a paid account yes, kind of thing. No, no, this is totally free. And there's like, I think, 10 gigs or something that's available. So they can store their data. I think that's us see somewhere. <clears throat> yeah, you get almost like 10 gigs of space to store your data. Yeah, 10 gigs like to store your data. And each of the data files is only a couple of kgs. So it's like you can store your entire research for what the spectrum in the cloud and you're good. And the, for the JPEG files, just put it in some other locations in cool. the server so you can use it. Yes. This can be matching? Yes. Oh. Now we just added it. It's not there in the full description yet, but we just added. But the matching, you always have to remember what library you have. And, and the problem is the libraries, um, can be commercial, so if you're using commercial libraries, that's a problem, but if you have your own library created, you have no problem. And, and you can access other open access libraries through this? Can you Not through connection? here, no, no. So you that would be cool your own. If you have your own, if you have, so, so you can. <laughs> uh, if you have your own, uh, the very simplest one, I think, like it's just very, very basic. I mean, you may have basic polymers, but. It's, it, it won't cut it, so for a lot of work. Do you see one day maybe being able to um, bring in open source libraries and hook up? Right now, them? this won't have it. It's the newer version, so right now, this one, um, it's, it's, they haven't updated it for a long time, I think. Um, it, well, it, this one won't, has only the, this is the first release de details that we have up here, um, so you can see only like the peak picks and other things, but um, you do have uh, access, but I would say use it with your own library that will give the best data. But um, for the folks who can't access here, like the instrument here and the software here, um, you can do way, way more like baseline corrections and a lot of other things that you may need to do. So here, 
think about it like a nice recording feature that you can do back home. So really good for students. So this is actually made for students, like for universities, so that they don't have to really spend, the, or they don't take the instrument's time, mainly, to just process their data. So, yeah, so, um, and that's why I'm going over Omnic. So the software that you will see tomorrow in the lab, that's called Picta, um, and it's basically exactly the same, but it has a, visual view on top of it. So what it is, is a visual view in the sense that that's the way you can image or see the spectra, uh, see the images, see the maps and other things like that. So that's going, and this runs in background for the other software, but this is exactly the way it's going to run. The other reason I want you to get more used to this is also, um, later on, like if you are coming back to run your sample when the study starts, uh, like in a couple of months, uh, I think, uh, so you may be like, oh, how do I create my own library, or how do I do this, how do I do that? There's like videos that will walk you through everything. How to create a library, how to do search, and everything like that. So, uh, not that I'm saying don't listen, but <laughs> uh, it's like, uh, there is, if you get stuck at any point, there is no problem, just go to our uh, website and there's like videos for everything, including how to collect a spectrum. There's like little videos that will walk you through the process. So, and, and that's why I want you to get more familiar with the economy by itself and what it can do for you. So, what we will do is we will, right now we'll take it as if we have run a spectrum. So I will open a spectra we will try to do a couple of things. One thing is search. So a quick and easy, simple search. What matters in searching, that would be the key right here. And how, what does the score values mean? What, how to even think about like if the spectra is right, matching is good or not. So that's what the whole goal of this afternoon is. Like we learn to um, understand our spectra not just because what the software is telling, but because we will do some of our eyeball test on those, like, okay, what we should do next, what we should do next to understand this better. So I will open a simple spectrum right up here. So here, because it is nicely named, because I have pulled it up right from our um, database, it's just nicely showing a nice name up there. So um, simple spectrum done on ATR, um, and uh, what we want to do is, we want to find out what this spectra is, right? So usually this is as simple as it is. You have a particle, you put it in, you ran your ATR, you have the spectra. So the question is what it is. So when the question is what it is, all you do is go under the Analyze tab, click on Library Setup. So this <coughs> is where you're setting up your library. So the whole library thing is, very interesting because if you <laughs> ask me, uh, Polymer Library is usually one of the best libraries we own, actually, because it's done. So if you look at Hummel Polymer Library, Sprouse Polymer Library, these are done in two really good polymer labs, and they have done it all. But the, and these are like commercial libraries. These are good quality commercial libraries that's available. But the problem is like what we discussed earlier. Um, does it really apply to what you are trying to do, everything? So every time you search it against a commercial library, take it with a grain of salt. Like, yeah, I know this is going to be just my core material. This is not complete, complete answer to what I'm looking for, right? So that's that. keep that always in mind. So, and in this case right now, if you look at, I have a big database here. So I can search against a really huge database. And do we have this as well, or is this, is this because this is your account kind of thing? Um, this is uh, what I have. Okay. So um, um, I think the standard that comes is 9,000. 9,000 spectral libraries. Like if anybody who buys an instrument who gets that, they add polymer bundles to it uh, like as they go along. And then there is something called ftirsearch.com. So that's the entire collection of what we ever sell. Um, is that great? Well, it's a good collection or it's the largest collection of spectras. 
if you were a failure analysis lab, you would have used it very often because you may find that one particle and you will be like, oh, what is this? I don't have this in my library. Then at that point, you definitely want to ftrsearch.com and search against there. So that is a pay-as-you-go site. So mm -hmm. it's like you find that spectrum that you have to match or find a kind of match for that, that's when you will use it. Um, in, in the area that you're looking at, uh, I think in a couple of months or maybe six months to a year, there will be a lot of labs that may come out with this really nice um, quality uh, spectral libraries, right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm putting pressure. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know Chelsea's lab um, is working on those. Um, um, in Hawaii, um, Dr. Jen Lin's lab is working on those. Um, so there are multiple labs that are putting a lot of effort into getting these polymers, weathered polymers, uh, colored polymers, name the polymer in all the different formats used. And, and I think if it comes out and if it's an open access, it's, it's going to be a really great source for all of you. I like to add a comment. I made a tool, open access tool, for um, analyzing spectral identification. Um, and so if you have spectra, reference spectra, and you can share with me, and I'll share with everybody else. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's a great tool. So it's it's open access, like anybody in my here can. Yeah, yeah. If you want the website, I'll give it to you too. Yeah. 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 Please send us too. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd love to hear your input. Because um, a lot of times, like when we are searching too, right? Because a lot of the materials, if it gets like weathered, right? I mean, if we get a better hint, we will have also have to understand better. So it's, yeah, that's great. That's a great suggestion. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so yeah, for now, for uh, the sake of learning the software, what we can do is we'll use what I have in my computer. And this is a pretty large. Um, database, and then I'll come back and show you if I use a small database, what, what happens. So I've set it up. I can run the search from here. I can search from here, or there's a little search button up in the top, so uh, you can search, click on the search right from there. So what it goes through all, and then you can see all the different uh, libraries that it pulls out. But in short, what it is telling is it's PVC, right? And it's a pretty high math score. One of the key questions that comes up is, what kind of math score should I trust as a good match or a bad match? And this comes up very, very often, especially when you're starting up. It's like, oh, it doesn't mean 98 if it shows up. It's a great match, and I can just report it as just PVC. I usually will say, just always overlay your spectrum even if it is 98 or even if it is 99, just always overlay your spectrum and see if all the peaks are spoken for. So in this case, let's see, if we have all the peaks matching up fairly good, yes, it is quite, quite, quite uh, possible and quite sure that this is the exact same material like PVC, what it is saying. But you also look at where my library is. So this is a library that was created with ATR. And in the beginning, I said the library, the spectra is an ATR spectrum, right? So in your case, what's going to happen is, uh, depending on what type of samples you have, right? Uh, some labs will be doing a lot of ATR and they will be doing a lot of ATR libraries. So if you are doing ATR and you're creating your ATR libraries, perfect no problem at all but some folks will not have the flexibility to do that they may have just the commercial libraries and they will be just running ATR so in that time is where you have to start to understand that ATR when you do you will have certain peak shifts that are going to happen you can convert a ATR spectra into a transmission like spectra so that you can match it to the commercial libraries mm -hmm. But it's not always going to be exactly the same. It's never going to be the same as a transmission library. Also, the commercial libraries that are in there, some are really good quality, and some may not be that good. 
So um, how, or, or the way you want to look at a library's uh, match is uh, based on, so all the things that you have to think, okay, was it a HR library it's matching to? Was it, um, if you're seeing small shifts, it's, is it because of the way that uh, you measure or way that the library was created, right? So that's why we really encourage all our users. I mean, it's not just uh, uh, the, the this group, but we always encourage our users to create their own library. Because creating your own, yes. Um, why does the diffuse reflectance measurements fit into that story? Uh, because for mapping, we probably use that yes. mode. Totally. Yes. So reflectance spectrum, so that's where the biggest problem happens, right? So <laughs> Perfect. It's, it's like, so, and tomorrow actually you will do this in the lab as well is, um, so you have nice libraries from, uh, uh, which is done in transmission, and now you have reflectance spectrum, and you're trying to match it against that. Your scores will never be in the 90s. It will be like hardly 70s or 60s if you're lucky. And, if you get peaks, that's great. Uh, I will show some spectra as well. Um, uh, that, that I mean, you then you will start to see yes, the peaks are there, but the spectrum looks not good, right? And and that's why it is uh, important that it's it's that we make a judgment even before sample analysis, like how we are going to analyze the sample. How am I going to get the good quality data? Out? So what we do is, or what we recommend is, if you want to really do automation, or you, you want to run automation for everything, so what I would recommend is create a small subset of library for the materials you're looking for in reflectance. So how do you do that? A lot of folks, what they will do is they'll get standards, or at least some pellets. In, in your case, like the pellets may be just like 15, 20 different pellets. Get those run, uh, either get the standard and run a uh, reflectance, or if these are isolated particles, what I would recommend is run an ATR so that you have a good quality spectrum and then run a reflectance spectrum or before and after so you know that, yes, ATR told me because I matched it up to a standard library that it is PVC. Mm -hmm. So now I'll just create a not so good spectra using reflectance, right? Because the software doesn't know anything. So you have to think about the software algorithm. Is It's not like it's using AI or anything yet. It is just two spectra, and it's just basically looking at a correlation. It is just simple mathematics is what it is doing, point to point correlation. So it's so I always say this, like if you get 98, you can get 98 on a spectra, which is just totally blank and has one peak as well. And it will just say, yeah, this is just a um, metal something spectrum. Does it mean it really is a metal something spectrum? No. Because it's just a nice flat line, it can just make a really nice correlation, and it will, it, you will see a really good match for it. So it's really important that you always overlay it. And if you have uh, the standards measured in the same way as your automated samples are going to come through, it will save you a lot of post-analysis time and effort. So otherwise, uh, if you try to keep matching it up to transmission, you will get frustrated. That's that's the big deal. The answer to, to your question, reflectance is depending on particle size and what the shape of the particle, right? Mm -hmm. So in order, in order to do a good reflective measurement, you generally have to rotate the sample, so you have a bunch of, of measurements that average to get a better spectrum like this. When you're doing microscopy, you cannot rotate the sample, right? So that's, that's one of your reasons. And, and we, if, if you look at anything with your, with your eyes and you change the angle with the regular light, you see differences in shades, sometimes even differences in colors, the same thing happening. How many rotations do you, like, Four times around, or uh, in the microscope you can't do it. In, in, no. in other cases, it's, you know, as, many, as many as you can, you're gonna you're gonna mm -hmm. actually gonna be able to actually more and more and more spectrum. Average. You're gonna have better, a better, a better average. It's a matter of statistics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I just built a library. We have a micro FTIR, and actually, what I did is I did um, an imaging array 
of like a map of the particles and then I picked different spots so that I could have multiple spectra in different areas and different thicknesses. Mm -hmm. So that's helped me a lot so far. Just my specificity. Same. I mean, yeah, yeah, you could do that. Mm -hmm. like yeah, because then it's different thicknesses. So yeah. even though they're close, they are slightly different. Yeah. Yeah. This spectra. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in whichever way you are looking at, so basically, if, if a particle is like this, then the light is coming back maybe better scattered. It just tilts a little. It may be the same particle. It may not have the, exactly the same amount of light coming and so the spectral difference can be pretty subtle in that sense. So um, that's why it, it's just like just like you mentioned, it's really important that we create uh, a library just the way you want to measure it. Yeah. And so to just to be clear, so when people are creating their libraries, they are doing it multiple different methodologies, right? Well, this is or is, there, or is that not automation? For the folks who are just doing one by one or picking or just okay with just doing like real lengthy uh, sample runs and go few really nice point pick samples and stuff like that, you can match it to just a regular ATR library to, or a regular transmission library. You will get good matches. But when you are thinking in terms of automation, that's where because the quality of the spectrum, because you're trying to run it fast, the quality can be lower. So you really want a spectrum that's way more better suited to be checked against that. Right. Well, I'm just thinking, because part of our overall goal, I think all of us here, are, is this coming um, interest in, in much more extensive sampling. So I'm just wondering if, if, you know, the best practice, which I totally get, is to take those fibers and squish them before you do it. It would be interesting to have somebody is, to do the fibers before you squish them. Yes. And then squish them, because eventually we might... Hopefully, we get to the yes. point where people don't have to do the squishing and can increase yes. the throughput time and stuff. Yes. So that's why I was just curious if people are doing all those different mm -hmm. permutations or if they're just no, uh, focusing on the ATR. Some ATM. labs are focusing in on those. So like um, fibers, reflectance, yes, great. So, so one of the simplest examples, and I'll also show it this afternoon, is um, cellulose and rayon. There is an effort, folks who want to separate it out and report it that this is cellulose and this much rayon. Very, very, very tricky because both have almost exactly this, actually exactly the chemical structure. It's just how they are polymerized, just how they are manufactured, that they just get these very small differences and that usually the difference is just with one or two peaks and that is in the 1100 region. Hmm. Um, Will a reflectance spectra go back and forth? Yes, a reflectance spectra would be almost difficult. And uh, there is one very nice report um, from a lab on, on differentiating this two out. Um, and we have tried it as well. Both transmission and ATR can be used, but reflectance, no. Just direct reflectance, can it differentiate between uh, rayon and um, uh, uh, regular cellulose? Almost, almost impossible. You can mm. measure for hours. You can get a very good quality spectrum. It's almost difficult because the peak will be pretty, pretty flattened out of that region. Um, but those are like the the real challenges that's going to come. And in that case, is where you definitely want to squish it, get a good data <laughs> out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So moving. Okay. So this is nice, easy, simple because I had some. Um, uh, spectra from ATR. So if we don't have a material in a particular library or if we just have very few stuff in the library, then what happens? So let's go back in and let me just remove all my libraries. And I'll just add just a dummy alcohol phenol library up here. So this is a perfect mismatch. I have a polymer. I'm just going to search it against. So this is where we are really forcing it to search, right? So this is what happens in a lot of instance that you don't have the material in um, your library. So it will just pull something out from the library and will give you uh, pretty low math scores, but then the spectrum is going to look different, right? So that's why it is really important you overlay it, make sure that it is 
the right thing or not. Just make sure at least some of the peaks are matching, why something is not matching, and so forth. So we call this our eyeball test. So this, this came from our, uh, uh, what we call Dr. Bradley, he's our product manager back in Madison. Um, so he was a professor before, and he trains us when we start with the company. So he always trains us, it is us, like when we train anybody, always tell folks, match score is fine, but always do the eyeball test. Otherwise, um, it, it definitely can talk a lot of different things um, because it's just an algorithm that's running. Okay, so this one was fairly straightforward, but let's bring in one more spectra. So this is um, what you may see a lot. So right, a lot of, of you folks um, are so interested in uh, this whole idea of microplastics is also because this is not good for anybody else, anybody actually. So uh, PVC is one material that gets a lot of additives added onto it. And one of the most common ones that gets added on is phthalates. So because that makes PVC really uh, pliable and uh, it can be bent and stuff so forth. So let's bring in a spectra of PVC with phthalates. So, so, so you can have overlaid spectrums or you can stack them. It's all um, depending on um, the user choice, how you, are, how you like to look at something. So a lot of peaks are similar, but you have those extra, what we call the bunny ears. So anytime- Bunny ears, yes. sweet. Um, <laughs> this is a, a, <laughs> This is a term actually uh, a lot of folks use for characterizing um, phthalates. It's the bunny ears in FTIR. <laughs> and this is the doublet. <laughs> it's a doublet that you see um, and we, that's the bunny ear. So let's look at this spectra just for a second on its own. So usually when you see those bunny ears in um, any polymer, it's, it's a very good indication that you may have some good amount of phthalates in there. Um, phthalates can be mixed in at a lot of different percents that you all know of, like anything that is soft and squishy and stuff like that, they do add phthalates to it, um, whether it's PVC or other materials. Um, so this little characteristic peak tend to show up uh, and if you be search this spectrum, uh, sorry, I didn't add the library. So now let me go back and add my library. Just let my rest of the library too. Are the bunny ears only at that small of a concentration? Or like, I'm looking at around 12,000. Mm -hmm. I would say that that could be another bunny yes. ear. Okay, so it can be any concentration. Any concentration. So why folks do this bunny ear thing is like, so this is PVC. Right, so but this can be pet, this can be a lot of other material where they add this in. So that little region kind of stays away from a lot of, um, I would say, contaminating peak. Okay, so that is kind of used like an identifying marker. Okay, so between like a thousand and two thousand is like the uh, no, the, the little uh, 1600. 1600. Oh, 1600. 1600. Okay, 1600 and um, 580, 1580. Sorry, um, but depending on where it is getting added into, whether it's pet or whether it's it, it the those two little things will stay pretty consistent okay. whether it's it like a they, they call the DEPC mm -hmm. the OP whatever it is it will all have that little character okay um, the little peak thank you there. so let me just add my library up so we can see what's going on and how to go about um, looking at this one let me add my group up. So I have saved my uh, libraries as a group. So if, uh, and you can always save libraries as a group also. So if there is a certain group of libraries that you like to use for certain type of searches, you can just go in and click save um, search list and you can have a certain group. Because sometimes in a common user facility labs, and that may be the same here, um, there may be folks who may create just a fiber 
library. And some of my folks may create just um, particles or palette libraries or anything like that. Um, so um, if, if you have a material and you really want to focus in and search on certain things, um, if you can save them as a group, uh, multiple libraries as a group, and then search against them. So if then you save it by your name or just an identifier. So let's search this one. So if we search this one, this is, gives some funny stuff, right? It says, I don't know, painting medium, hmm. uh, back, electrical back taping, and all that. So when you go through these, these a lot of these are commercial materials, right? So look at, so it is going straight up into commercial materials, and maybe one or two um, hints that okay, it may have electrical tape backing or tape plasticized PVC film. So. It, it gives a good idea to you that a lot of commercial materials have the plasticizers in there. So that's why it is going now matching to all these commercial materials. Because this is already there in the library. But in your case, you only had a PVC spectra. You don't have all this, right? And think in the terms that you don't have any of these commercial libraries. You don't have all these to even think about that, oh, does it is it looking the same? What should I look for? What can you do? If you have a spectrum and you have a standard spectrum, you can always subtract, right? So you take the, un uh, uh, the unknown and you know, okay, if this is something mixed into it, you can always subtract it out, the, your standard, and see what's left, and then try to uh, match it up again. <clears throat> so, we have this spectra, and we already had our PVC spectra, so let me bring that PVC spectra back. So we have two spectra. One was PVC and one PVC with some phthalates. So what I can do is I can go in and say process, and I will just subtract. So what you're doing is you're subtracting a PVC spectrum out from a PVC with some palettes. This is also going to happen when you analyze some things on membranes, when you analyze some things on um, certain substrates and things like that, because you may see a little fiber stuck to a surface of a polymer or something like that. You may want to take a spectra on the fiber, right up, but and also on the side that is the substrate where you have that, and why? because you can always subtract the substrate out from this mixture that you're getting. So here we will just subtract it out. So here, when you do the subtraction, the top one, the bottom one, the so bottom one is getting subtracted out from the top one. This is to set the, uh, uh, the factors. So here we can just play around and see which factor gives us more. Um, so factoring out is, kind of subtracting equivalent amount from the mean sample. So now, I, I feel like I have gotten rid of most of the negative peaks and I have mostly the peaks that should stand out on its own. So I will just add that. I'll just add it to the window. So now this is a subtraction result, right? So this is not the original spectra. This is a spectra where I already subtracted the PVC out. Now if I do a search, what happens? So now if I do a search, it goes straight up and pulls, it's with a very high confidence, a, a phthalate. So why? Because now, if we look, these things did not come up earlier, right? There is another way to make this come up, and that is in a mixture analysis, but let's look at this this way. So the simplest way to get something that is in a really low concentration uh, show up better is if you know what is in the main concentration, subtract it. And this is going to be exactly the same whether you do IR or Raman. You can always subtract out the major contaminant out or the major feature out so you can see the, uh, the, the minor, minor thing that's mixed in because colors are the other things, right? A lot of you may want to even, uh, may look into characterizing colors because when you look at colors uh, which are mixed into uh, polymers, uh, if it is in a percent, or I would say one to five percent and above levels, you can easily subtract the main polymer out and get and see what colors were added into that particular polymer in, in exactly the same way. The same is with other additives like calcium carbonates, calcs, anything like that, it will do, you can do exactly the same. So, 
So what we did right now is two nice spectra. So now you have a nice spectra and suppose I want to do some peak pigs and show it in a nice record. I can just do peak pick. And um, when you do the peak picking, this little vertical line is like the threshold line. So I, if I want to pick these smaller peaks, you can use the threshold lines or if you don't want it, you just keep the threshold lines all the way higher up. Uh, you can also improve the sensitivity, like if you really want these shoulders to be picked up, you can also increase the sensitivity of how it is picking the peak. So I can just increase the sensitivity and then we keep picking a lot, so it will even pick the tiniest peak. So this is just for reporting functions, so if you want to report, it's, it's nice and you can just save it like that. Okay, oh, one of the key things, again, um, I forgot to mention is it is important to look at definitely what method your libraries were me measure, but also the second thing is the resolution. So uh, a lot of the standard libraries are at a resolution of four. And when you do microscopy, a lot of folks will do it at eight because that's good enough. Um, but then there will be folks who will do microscopy at four as well. So it, um, if you're comparing a sample to sample, sample to library, always try to keep the resolutions pretty similar when you are comparing. Um, if it's exactly the same, your matches are going to be way, way better. So these are nice and simple spectrums which we can do searches, we can do a, a, a subtraction, we can do peak picking. So the other things uh, that you may be interested to do is create your own library. And creating your own library is really, really simple. You just do it once and set up that uh, library just once and then every time you want to do, you, you just add it to it. Just just one single button click. So I really will encourage you to just at least even have what we call like a library of all the things that you have seen so far because what you will see is contaminations always repeat. They always repeat. So why I say this is uh, when we get samples in lab from a lot of different industries, can anybody guess what would be the common, most common contaminant? Make a couple of guesses actually. Polyethylene. 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 More guesses. If it's Water. a particle. Pardon me? Water. Water. If people are running these uh, production facilities, right? Like, think a little bit harder. What's the most skin. common? Actually, if you just skin our hair. Yes, skin or hair. I'm good then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes, actually uh, for a lot of clean room samples that when we analyze, so clean room samples like most mostly for the semiconductor fab people, the most common contaminant, skin cell. Skin particles, skin cells. You'll see it over and over again. The other common thing actually, you'll see silicates. Why? Because it's everywhere, right? I mean, hmm. you may have the cleanest air, but you open your Petri dish once, you'll get at least two particles or three particles in it, easy. It's, it, this is like, I'm not like, nicest, cleanest clean rooms, you can find those. So a um, lot of clean rooms, what they do is they leave like little vapors um, right on the bench and then they check it every week, what they're collecting because that's like their background, right? What you will collect and most of the things you will collect and, and for uh, you guys will have access to your lab at once um, here as well, and you will see. The most common thing you will see deposit there is going to be skin cells. Then you'll have a couple of fibers um, that will come through also, and you will also see some silicates. I mean, if if the air, air filters are not working at the best levels, you'll see a lot of silicates coming. Like whenever we open one filter in our lab, we know we have already introduced silicates in it because our labs are just simple like office room labs, so it's like you introduce silicates. Yeah, great guesses. What are the sources of the silicates? Dust. 
So like you did a quick search, right? So you may have searched and you see like, yeah, 70% is what you're get. So the math score of 70 is what you're getting. If the math score uh, that you're getting was to PE that you were getting, and then if you have a standard PE spectrum, just subtract it out and see what's left. Okay. You always will have to see what's left because that's what we check also with the overlay is what is there a tiny bit of peak that is left that is not an accounted for? Because there will be a lot of story behind because some of the peaks are merged into other peaks. Mm -hmm. So unless you subtract that one material out, you may not really see it. When you say subtract, you actually mean like subtraction. You know, the intensities are being subtracted from the match spectra mm -hmm. to the ref. Yes. The yes. Okay. That's one way to do it. So, oh, yes. Uh, once you subtract something out, do you then run another match? To yes, find yes. Out what the that's, yeah, that's, that's exactly what we did. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. Then you run another match, and then you see what is in that case. And, and so that, that, raw, that raw match score, the first match score, is just a simple arithmetic, right? It's not like, it's not like a multiple regression. It's not like a principal components kind of thing where you're no, trying to a partition. it's a correlation. It's a simple, it's simple correlation. Simple though, right? correlation, yeah. yes. Right. It's a very simple point, 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 point to point. point. Right, right, right. Which, which is probably why you're getting off, right? Yeah, yeah. I was getting confused. Yeah. So, yeah. so the assumption was that oh, it's actually looking and accounting for this and that, but it's yeah, just it's I'm simple. Yeah, I'm trying to characterize all these particles in the environment. I'm like, right. what do I call them when they're right. not even that you know up front? Like I can't right. get a good match on them. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's why, like, one of the things uh, for the folks. That's why I always say, like, always think, like, if if you're characterizing them individually, you can even, you have more power to just go in, go more analysis, more in-depth analysis and stuff like that. But if you are doing automation, you will have to extract those spectra out where you are seeing, yeah, okay, this is giving me a 70 math score. So now let me extract that spectra out from the big group of data and then try to run them individually. Run them individually is like um, analyze or process them individually okay. and look through. Absolutely. No problem. No problem. No problem. But you can have a routine that does that. Automatically. You can program a routine that does that. Automatically. Yes. So that's where we are going next. <laughs> so, um, yes. Quick, so maybe to make it more complicated. If you have a PET sample, all you have to do is test up. How do you differentiate that with three families? You said now, but just the one you have to do inside. That's that pro. Yes. So it makes it very, very, very challenging separate for pet right. with which is in and it has a very small amount of uh, values added in right. and subtract it out you have to have a precise pet spectrum to subtract really precise so if you have done uh, the the <coughs> unknown particle with the germanium meteor run another one with the standard with the germanium meteor then subtract it out you will see the difference yes okay so we, we here we talked about subtracting it out, looking at it in depth, uh, and seeing what this concept, what this contaminant is. So just like uh, 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 a suggestion came up, can we just create this as a routine? Can the software do this for you automatically, right? Yes, it can do this for you, I would say more or less automatically, if you have the individual components somewhere stored in your library. So suppose 
you can have phthalates stored, you can have your pets stored, you can have all the individual components or contaminants that can show up stored as somewhere in a the library. Then we have the software that's called the Spectre that will help you look at components. Components in the sense that are um, larger, um, so if you have three components material or two component material or even four component material, you can separate them out as individual materials. But those individual components must be there in the library. If you don't have those, then the software has no clue how to even go about it. Again, the other part is if your individual component is really low in concentration, like maybe like three or four percent, like the dyes or the phthalates and stuff like that, it gets very tricky because if the spectrum, the spectral features are not very clear, it cannot even separate it out. So in that cases, you definitely want to check it out by subtracting on your own because you have more flexibility, more um, power to do that when you do it on your own. But yes. The reality of how complex all of these matches is says to me that like all the mapping software that people are hoping is just gonna like make a map of what's there, that that's not gonna work. I don't know. When don't be pessimistic. <laughs> don't be pessimistic. It's going to work. It's totally going to work. Should we, should we be going through 100,000 spectra one by one to make our spectrum maps? Or should we be like trying to automate this procedure? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, great, great point. Well, <laughs> Very aggressive. Can you automate everything um, and every bit of particle like analysis that would come out from the automated analysis? No. You cannot, because uh, I mean, I think uh, we'll have to come out with some AI-based algorithms, <coughs> I'll be very honest, um, to get to that level, right? Because um, simple algorithms, uh, or the software algorithms, right, is just looking for simple correlations or simple PCA, and then even MCR, and all that is there. But are you able to just get a clear cut, like, yeah, this is this much of polyethylene to blah, blah, blah matches. It's, it's, it's still a little gray, I would say, when you come to automation. If you had it, especially if you're trying to do a map, and, and the reason is not just that, if you have great libraries that are done in exactly the same mode and you have a lot of uh, data collected in the same way, your chances are way better. So it's, it's always going to be more of like, have you measured a spectrum just like this before and do you know the true identity of that? Because all you're trying to do here is uh, match it up to something that you think is the way it is, right? So can you bring in a standard that was just like that? And that is what is going to be the most tricky thing in, in what you're doing. Like, is going to be weathered, like if, if you're a PVC, weathers for like 50 years, is it going to look exactly the same, like if it is weathered for like five years, or maybe a year? Most likely not, right? So, it's, yep. but can you say this is PVC? Yes, that you can say, but why those smaller differences are in there, and if the math scores are going to be like perfect, like grade 90, 95, no. You won't reach there. But I think it's similar to, yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think it's what's the question. And so right now, <coughs> there's a, been a big explosion of talking about air quality in terms of these cheap sensors to detect um, particulate matter. And the traditional air quality chemists are like, oh, 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 these things overestimate particle size, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in reality, thousands of these units have been sold. And so the resolution isn't super exact, right? We don't know exactly exact particle amounts, but what you gain in terms of the massive sample size, you can see fires burning, you can see all this kind of stuff. So I think it really matters as to what the question is. So yes. at this level of characterizing every single particle or every single compound, yes, we'd like to know that, but, but that might not be the regulator's thing, right? They right. just want, mm -hmm. want to know is, is there human generated crap in the water or not, right? And at that level, <laughs> at that level, it might be way better to do the rapid mapping right now so we can get yes. feedback for these policies and stuff. So I think it, I think both tracks should be pursued. I don't think we should abandon either one at this point. Go further into it, then you can yes. delve into it. Totally, totally. I saw a 
So just uh, let's, let's, let's send it to the I of 10 uh, MX device. So when you're imaging, when you're rap doing the rapid imaging, it has to be reflectance. And what's it the? It can be transmittance as well. Okay. Yeah, it can be transmittance. It can be reflectance. Can, but it, can it be? Tra it can't be transmittance if you're on a filter. Right? Uh, it depends on the filter. Okay. Yeah. So there are really thin Teflon filters okay. that you can use. So let's say you have the best filter possible, uh -huh. and you and you want to set that up for the highest resolution possible mm -hmm. using transmittance. Mm -hmm. What what's the the best resolution? Um, for transmittance, I would say 10. Just let's focus in 10. Pixel size or 10. particle identification? Micro particle, particle identification size to okay. 10. Will you identify smaller? Yes, if you run even like higher resolution map, you may get better, but we, we want to say more like a 10, 10 because of the refraction of the uh -huh. reports. And with reflectance, if you're having to use something else that doesn't allow trans transmission? Um, it would be the same. 10 to same. 15 is where you are, with both with transmittance and reflectance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But um, it's like, has folks pushed the limits? Yes. They push it down to five, yes, you can get it. Like the spectra we saw, uh, the, like the data we saw for the microbeads in the muscle tissue. Those are done at five. Those can be, those clearly, those uh, microbeads could be seen in like resolution, which are like just size five, right? So we could see it very well. So and that wasn't backed up with APR. No, no, no. That was just a reflectance spectrum. Uh, we have done, uh, I mean, a lot of other for other industries for life science and stuff like that. A lot of fives. We do fives and eight and in, in reflectance as well. Um, but sometimes, so in this case, when you looked at the spectrum, it's it's. Uh, that one was, I would say, an easier sample to do um, at that because you're looking for just two differentiations, right? One was polyethylene, and the other thing you were looking for is just the tissue. So you had just basically two regions to basically differentiate it out. But um, on a normal sample set, um, it can be way, 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 way too much. So, and then there's always particle overlaps and other things. So that's where the more challenges are going to come in. Mm -hmm. Like when particles overlap, or when there's just too many stuff in there, uh, one underlying layer, then on particles sitting on top of particles. In other spectroscopies, they call that matrix interactions. Mm -hmm. So if your matrix are completely different, your resolution is mm -hmm. going to be higher. Mm -hmm. right? The intuition of polymer is a completely different thing. So something's going to pop up very yeah. different than the other stuff. Mm -hmm. OK. so. Um, what we want to do next is look at a spectrum that's really complex and then see if we can separate it out just by the SPECTA software, which has the multi-component analysis built in. And you will see that if the, um, the components are built in, the software will easily pull it out. All the different three different, four different components that you're asking it to pull it out, it will easily pull it out. But it must be there. So let me pull. Oh, that looks nasty. <laughs> Actually, it's a very nice, it's a very good quality spectrum. Uh, it just has too many peaks. So if you, anybody has aspirin in their bag, tomorrow they can run it in the lab and it will look exactly like this. <laughs> that's what it is. It's, it's, it's just a bit of an aspirin tablet. So that's what this, but think about aspirin. Aspirin is not just one material, right? One of the key components in there is actually caffeine. Mm -hmm. And we'll see how the software pulls it out. So you have caffeine, you have a acetaminophen, and you have acetylsalicylic acid. So if we do a simple search, like what Omnic will regularly do, you just do a quick search, you'll start to see, I mean, in this, you see it's what it is pulling up because it has aspirin and I have the common materials library selected, so you get a pretty nice hint right up there that it's, it's aspirin, right? So you can see that. But this is a mixture of three different components. And how do we know? You can start to see if I uh, look through, it says, oh, it, I may have aspirin plus caffeine, or I may have acetylsalicylic acid, and all these math scores, except the one up on top here, bear aspirin and aspirins, these are really close. So what this is indicating is basically there's peaks coming from a lot of other stuff that's in there. So let me just pull one 
of this, so just the acetone salicylic acid and um, overlay it. So what we are seeing is a lot of peaks that would match and a lot of them that won't match, right? So this is the kind of hints you want to look at when you look at a sample um, is, uh, yes, the top score material is what's going to be the best, but here that's because I have it in the library. If you don't have it in the library, it's just going to pull up all these things, and then what you really want to know is what is in there, right? So what we can do is we send it to the software um, called Spectre. So we can go click on um, Analyze, and we send it to Spectre. The Spectre is a software that does almost everything similar to Omnic, and uh, but what it has additional is it does these multi-component separation. So just like what you mentioned, like can we automate it, just subtract the first one, then subtract the next one, then subtract the next one, that's exactly what it does for you. So it goes and finds the best match, just gets the residue, just matches it again, just gets the residue, and then it just pops up and shows you the data. So let me just open Spectra up here. Is that also open source? Uh, this one, no. This one is in the computers here. Yes. Yes. I, as far as I know, no, right? Good try, good one. try. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Omnic is open, but um, Spectre is not. Yeah. So, so once it, it's in Spectre, and in Spectre does almost similar things, like you have searches, search by peaks, and multi -comp. So th what this is what we are going to do, the multi-component searching. So under multi-component searching, instead of going and selecting all the spectras, what I'm going to do is I will have just, I'll pick one library which has the individual components in there, and that's the um, comprehensive forensic library, which is a fairly nice library with all um, the chemicals that's in there. I can search the whole region, I can search a small region, or so forth, so I have just selected that library. And first thing what I will tell usually is just look for the second component. Um, if, and, and why we start with two component systems, you can always tell it to go find four, three or four components. That's fine too, but usually when it is a total unknown, we start with two components and just tell, okay, go search for it. You see, it, it takes a little time because it has to go through the process. So long. Sorry. So long. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. Uh, so here it's giving me, it tells, it could be two component system. It's a, it says salicylic acid and caffeine. But if we look down, it also says an option that it could be salicylic acid and acetaminophen, right? Look at, if you look at the last. So it has, and, and if you look at the math scores, they're pretty close. So that means what it is telling me is that it could be, uh, I asked or I forced it to search for two components. But, and what it does is so up here on the top, what you're looking at, the black spectrum, is what we call a composite. A composite is an addition of these two spectra. So if I, let me, show the terrain so you get a better idea of what's going on. So it is, what it is telling me is this much portion of one component and that green portion of the other component. Good, but then I have a little bit of doubt that it could also have acetaminophen as a in it because there is a lot of peaks that are matching exactly the same. So what we do is, let's increase the components now because now I'll tell it, go do a search for three components. That means you have to look for three different. So it will go in, it will do one more round where it is going for the third residual. So it's going for first, second, and then looking for the third. And, and you're not specifying the type, you're just saying three. Just three. Just, just look for three look components. For three so components. because this is where like you see that two extra peaks, oh, that means that something else is in there as right. well. So you go do more searches. One at a time. One at a time. So it gives, us more control over it, but um, a lot of times, like um, um, I think um, Andrew had mentioned in his talk, like if you are somebody who has done spectroscopy for like 45 or 50 years, like, <laughs> you look at a spectrum and say, no, 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 that's a multi-component of so and so because your your eyes are so trained that 
they may just go in and do like a third, three or four components. But if, if you're looking at a spectra for the first time, you're trying to get the best that you can get out of it, then um, go, it's better to go step by step. Okay, so now if you look at it, it's giving us a better, little better mass score. At the same time, you can start to see almost all the peaks are getting spoken for, right? The, at the corner, it is cutting it off, if you look at that, because some of the spectrum are measured only till 650. So you will see libraries where you don't have the whole 400 to 4,000 range. You will have libraries where it is only 650 to 4,000 because somebody made an ATR spectrum. They don't have the rest of the region or they whatever technique they use, they didn't decide to go below that. So those will have cutoffs. So that's, but still what it is doing is, if you look at the peaks all the way from down here to here, the composite peak or the addition, composite is the addition of this up there, gives you a very good um, uh, uh, idea of that, yes, almost all the spe peaks are getting spoken for, right? So it's, so suppose if you have polymers that are mixtures, polystyrene plus polyethylene plus PVC, if you have measured the individual components, uh, it's almost always easier to pull it out in the um, mixture analysis or multi-component searches. But if you don't have it measured in and have a good quality spectrum in it, it's not going to work. So what's in your, so this is the case where like what's in your library is what's going to come out as a data. Um, so the other thing, if you look at it, um, it will give these ballpark figures for composites. This is not true concentrations, but it's, almost within 10%, with most of the analysis that I have seen so far, it's quite semi-quantitative, that you can say, yes, PVC is almost like 80%, and maybe there's 20% of polyethylene or PET or something added into it, yes. So that's what the composite up there tells you, and that is just based on how much uh, uh, absorbance that each of the spectrums contributing to. That's where, how you get that data. Um, so one more thing I want to show is uh, this morning um, somebody had asked a question about uh, the uh, having the information about uh, polymers and having the information about uh, the spectral interpretation and other things. So you have basically two books that are built into the software as well. So um, this one, which is um, basically a polymer book, is very very nice and. Um, what you can actually do is you can always save this, and then you have the book. <laughs> Thanks. I didn't say that. <laughs> um, so it's it's a really nice polymer book where you have all the all the different classes of uh, uh, polymers. Very let me just push this. So so you can see all the different classes of uh, polymers actually just in there. So if you are looking for information on any polymeric group, it should be all in there with the structures um, and with all the information uh, as well as references and everything like that. So it, it comes in very handy when, when you're trying to interpret a new uh, kind of a spectrum or something like that and you need some background information to put in a paper or so. The other thing is these um, inter the spectral interpretation guides that are also built into the software. So each of this will have a lot of details compared to the wheels that you have. Like the wheels are also really handy. You can put it to any particular location. So I see a peak at 1720. What would it mean? Is it just a CO? What else it could be? Which other groups can contribute to that? It, it, it's pretty handy to do that, but then you can also look at the software for more information on where else to look for, or what else to look for. Okay. So that's what I wanted to show in um, SPECTA, in OMNIC, and uh, so tomorrow, for the folks who are attending the class, it's, it's going to be another level, because we will be running maps, 
we will be running a lot of particle analysis and so forth. So we will do uh, principal component analysis, NCRs, and everything like that on day two. So those will be one more step up to add the complexity for um, searching. 